Isn't it great living near the Hatfield Forest? It's brilliant. Not only is it good for compo, for walks, but it's just chock full of the most incredible veteran trees. So beautiful to look at and absolutely essential for rare invertebrates. On Tree Lady Talks today, you're going to be talking to Vicky Bankston and also you're going to be talking to Xander Antboy Johnston. Xander is a young naturalist. He's currently at high school and he specialises in wood ants and rare and endangered invertebrates found in the Scottish Highlands. Fascinating, fascinating, very, very passionate young man. It's brilliant, isn't it? Vicky is an ecologist and has worked professionally with nature conservation since 1992. Up until 2003, she worked in England and now works primarily in Sweden. Vicky has worked throughout her career with issues relating to practical management and restoration of ancient trees and wood pastures. She also trains arborists, landscape architects, site managers and planners in the care and management of ancient trees. She was project manager for the European Vet Tree and Vet Cert projects, developing training and a certification system for veteran tree professionals across Europe. And Xander has done a lot of stuff even at this early stage in what's looking like it's going to be a great career on Country File, Blue Peter, Spring Watch, he's been on Autumn Watch, he's been on more TV than I have. He strongly believes that insects are the foundation of the ecosystem and without them, nothing would survive, including us. You're listening to Sharon Durden Hollenby and this is Tree Lady Talks. All views expressed by me or our interviewees are our own. Well, hello, Vicky Benkson. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really pleased to have you. Thank you for having me. It's lovely to be here. Could you just explain a little bit about your background, please? Yeah, well, I'm an ecologist um, and I've worked with nature conservation for almost 30 years. And um, I've worked both in England and now primarily working in Sweden, but also involved in a few European projects so uh, I kind of dip my toe into a few other countries as well but mostly I'm working with issues related to old trees um, and wood pastures where they grow in their natural environment that's kind of my main area of interest. Sounds absolutely heavenly to me I absolutely love old trees and veteran trees and ancient trees and um, could you just explain to some of the listeners who may not really understand you know, what is so great about a veteran tree? And why do we need to be so in, enthralled by them and protect them? Well, for me as an ecologist, they're like a living block of flats. So each one of them is different and they've been there often for a very long time. So if you think about an oak, it could have been in that same spot for 500 years. And in that time, it's developed about 250 different flats. Uh, from the top to the bottom, flats that are south facing with a balcony compared with those that are on the ground floor and north facing. And all of us have got different requirements. I mean, I live in the countryside. I love sitting outdoors. Other people prefer to live in a city on a ground floor flat. It's a bit of the same in an old tree. It's absolutely full of life and different sorts of life. And all of those lives are connected to one another. And I just find that so fascinating. But from a nature conservation point of view, they're rare, super rare. We, I think, sometimes take for granted those of us who work with old trees because we find them out or we search them out. But actually across Europe, they're an extremely rare feature now in our landscape and something that we need to protect the ones we have and also ensure that we've got old trees for future generations. So they're I guess that's that's how I see them as a living block of flats, really. I love that analogy. It really just builds a picture in your mind. And are these ancient and veteran trees, are they scattered? Are they far apart from each other? Or do we have many collections of wood pasture? And I'm thinking near me, we've got Hatfield Forest, which is internationally important wood pasture landscape. Absolutely. Very close to my heart too. I spent six years working and living at Hatfield Forest. So I feel like I've got a relationship with just about every old tree there. Yeah. Um, the, the short answer to that is no. 
um, we they're very very scattered. Um, there are small sites with concentrations like Hatfield Forest, like Epping Forest. Essex is actually, in fact, East Anglia is a pretty good spot for old trees in general. But I can count on my hands the number of sites with more than a thousand old trees in concentrations in the UK and the same in Sweden where I work. And then when you start going south, you have to pretty much go down to the Pyrenees in France and Spain to find concentrations of old trees or Romania to the east. Um, and there there are large areas which have still got wood pasture and are still functioning in the sense they've got the grazing animals, the old trees, regeneration and the bushes and all of those elements. But actually in northern Europe, we uh, they're very scarce and often in isolated pockets. Do you think that the trees which are isolated from other veteran trees, presumably they have a much lower ecological value because of poor rates of dispersal? Or is it not as simple as that? It's not as simple as that. In fact, I mean, there's a whole issue there. What, the thing we call extinction debt. So as an ecologist, and that's a theory that everybody learns at school, but it's somewhere back in the in your brain somewhere what's extinction debt but if you think of it like Noah's Ark you know that as the water level rises on that little island where all those animals were they all get closer and closer together as the water level rises so you can almost imagine that a single old tree in the middle of an arable field could potentially have masses of species associated with it because they've all jumped across as the sea level has risen or in this case as agriculture or forestry has developed and the old trees have disappeared and that means you can have this slightly skew with picture that you can have a single old tree which has got ridiculous number of species on it for the fact it's a single old tree but that makes it incredibly vulnerable because when that tree dies which I guess inevitably it will even if it can live for a long time and might outlive all of us it still makes it very vulnerable so the the issue of dispersal is one that we know quite little about we know some species have relatively poor dispersal but I think it's not as straightforward as that either Sharon I think that species if I mean you know why would you move if you're happy in your house why would you move? It's only when the house starts to get damp or it gets too small for you or you've outgrown it that then you might move. So if you think our research projects are five years, four years at best, and actually most people live in their homes for more than four or five years. So those species that we've studied in that four or five years might think, actually, I've got the perfect house. I don't need to go anywhere. But then all of a sudden, when things aren't optimal anymore, potentially they can move. And we don't really know how far they can move. But what we do know is when there's obstacles in the way, it makes it much harder. So if you're a beetle that needs to warm up in the sunshine and you decide, right, now's the time. I'm going to find another new oak tree that's perfect for me because this one's not quite right anymore for whatever reason. And you take off and you hit a spruce woodland or you hit an arable field where there's nothing to feed on, then even if you've got all the energy in the world, the chances of you actually finding another tree is limited. So I think that's part of the problem with the research we have is that there's lots of things going on in our landscape. It's become very difficult. It's what's the word? It's not transparent anymore. You know that that things can't move even if they could <laughs> because they face obstacles, which might be an urban environment or it could be a plantation or an arable field. And I think that's one of the big issues in Northern Europe, particularly, is we just don't have uh, connect connectivity in our landscape anymore, whereby species can move, uh, even those that perhaps aren't as willing to disperse as easily. Birds, you know, they can move long, long distances, but the smaller the creature gets, the slower it often is to disperse. And that's a, a general generalisation, but it's still how we, we look at things. Then we have fungi which can also disperse on the wind. So it's a very complicated picture, Sharon, really. It is. And it all um there are so many common themes in discussing this about creating pathways for nature, albeit ideally by retaining those features in the first place, such as hedgerows or small woodland areas. I mean that's the ideal. 
or where they're not retain, retained or have been lost a long time ago to actually make sure that as part of new development there are species rich, rich hedgerows planted with dead wood amongst it and you know all sorts of different types of dead wood and connecting to something else so this is a a real wake up call at the moment um in the UK we watched I think many people watched David Attenborough on Sunday night on extinction and I think that was for those who aren't interested in wildlife I do hope they watch that program because what you're talking about here is potential extinction of some niche species due to you know the lack of ability to find other food source so tell us about your project Mm. how did that start well how did it start well just to say David David Attenborough is my hero yeah. It has been since I was, you know, 20 years old. I actually bumped into David Attenborough at a conference on the way to the toilet. And ah. <laughs> it's my claim to fame. <laughs> that would have um, been your headline if only I'd have known. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Ricky bumped into David on the way to the toilet. <laughs> um, how did it start? Well, one, I guess I've been involved with Ancient Tree Forum a long time and Ted and Ted was my mentor from when I started working um, almost 30 years ago and he's always somebody you know pulling off a grenade and chucking it in and making you think and when I was working at Hatfield we were doing some work doing some restoration of wood pasture there and we've got some fabulous old pollards at Hatfield and we were thinking about you know new new old pollards how can we make new trees to become pollards of the future or old pollards of the future and suddenly it kind of struck me that it seemed a bit bonkers that we were cutting trees down we were cutting them down to give more light to the old trees in order to save the old trees and we were literally sitting having a cup of coffee Sharon you know out with our kit and I was like well couldn't we just damage a few instead of felling them because if we fell them they're gone that's it you know they're gone forever whereas if we damage them a bit they won't be as competitive to the old trees so that'll be a benefit and potentially maybe they might develop some of the interesting little flats that the old trees got a bit more quickly so that's really where it started and that's back in oh say the late late 90s I suppose and we started off pretty small scale we had sledgehammer had a go with sledgehammer on a tree and we had a go with drilling a few holes and breaking a few branches off topping trees all the things that you learn not to do if you want to take care of trees and that was sort of the, the ethos behind it in a way it was like well looking at things that occurred in nature so when you look at an old tree what do you see you see broken branches you see you know rips and tears you see exposed wood you see small cavities you see holes at the bottom and it kind of started relatively small scale and over various discussions with lots of people who've both influenced and impacted the ideas including David Lonsdale and Ted and Jill and and others you know that people will be familiar with and and I guess that that's where it started then you know if you fast forward we did very carefully actually when I worked at Hatfield we recorded everything we did on the trees took photographs of them and this is pre-digital so I mean, you can just picture we had a laminated numbers on a clipboard, somebody ha- holding it up in front of the tree so that we could match the photos with the tree number and all the things we did. And then all of those records, there was a massive flood at the offices at Hatfield and all of those records got destroyed, Sharon, oh, no. which absolutely broke my heart, really did. Fast forward a wee bit and I moved to Sweden. And from about 2002, we ran courses taking Swedish ecologists over to the UK and at one of those trips we were at Hatfield and I showed some of the trees where we'd done this veteranization a couple where we'd hit with a sledgehammer and one of those I could get I could get my whole fist in and the base like the decay was happening and two of the guys that came on that course were like have you done any monitoring of this Vicky do you know what species it benefits do you know how many survive and what techniques are the best and I'm like um well you know there's a story behind that and I explained the problem with with all the records and so as a consequence of that we applied for some money and put together a project in 2011 to run a really big trial on this to actually do it in a scientific way so that we would be able to evaluate the results on a large scale 
So we hoped we might get between five and 10 sites involved in this project, but we actually have 20 sites altogether. And there are 16 in Sweden, one in Norway and three in England, and which means it's almost about a thousand trees involved in it. And we did the work, the actual veteranization work. So veteranization, as we call it now, is a technique whereby you damage young living trees, young, young vital living trees that you would otherwise probably remove because they're comp competing with old trees or where you want to thin out the, the population. So we, we focused on oak in this particular project because oak is the most long lived species. It's also generally has a high number of associated species when it's old and we have often a generation gap. So the issue you were talking about earlier, Sharon, about, you know, isolation and fragmentation in the landscape. Well, that's one of the reasons why veteranization kind of feels to me like it's a tool in our toolbox that if we try it, it might work. And if we don't try it, we know it won't work, you know, and I guess that's that's the way that I'm thinking. But this trial has just been so exciting and and so exciting but i'm going to ask the arb question on, now so there, there'll be some people listening to this saying you can't top trees yeah i know you can't put a sledgehammer into a trunk now i understand that to some extent these trees were expendable in that they would have been removed for what we call halo thinning or other reasons but have any of these trees died just from an ARB point of view. Actually, very few, Sharon. I've just literally on Thursday last week finished revisiting all 16 of the sites in Sweden. I'd hoped to visit also the ones in Norway and England, but obviously with COVID, that's not been an option. Yeah. Helen from Burnham Beaches has done Ashton Common, which is one of the sites in England on Thursday as well. So there'll be 17 of the sites that we will have visited. And I think about two... I can't remember the exact numbers because I've not analysed the data, but it's not more than a handful of trees that have actually died in those eight years. And in fact, at least one of those trees is a tree we haven't done anything to. So these trees are incredibly resilient and we choose trees that are very healthy from the beginning. And that's the other thing. It goes a bit against the grain that you damage healthy trees. But I think that we've made such a mess of our landscape, Sharon, by turning it over to agriculture, having monocultures of forestry, that we've got a generation gap. And if we do nothing, we know what's going to happen. The old trees will eventually die and we will lose the species associated with it. Obviously, we make sure we've got young trees that will go on and do the whole thing naturally because Mother Nature does it best. We know very few of the secrets that lie behind how these habitats develop. And therefore, the way we're doing it might be just completely off the wall but the the work that I've been doing literally that I finished on Thursday I've been so excited because we've found so many things we've found bats two at least two different species possibly three different species using the cavities we've created we have found water pockets with hoverfly larvae in them we have found wood mice which was a real find, a new one for me. Wood mice appear to be chewing the callus on the cavities we've created and helping keep them open. Wow. They're filling them full of fresh leaves. They're using them to stash the hazelnuts. And oh. it's not, it's not um, door mice, it's wood mice that we're finding. We've had woodpeckers eating yes. uh, larvae from the fracture cuts where we've topped trees. We've had um, decay and these what we call tree ants as well that are making use of these and that is the one of the most exciting things for an ecologist yeah tiny wee ants but they they pave the way for all sorts of other species that come afterwards particularly the beetles because they move in they probably take with them fungal mycelium which start the decay process which in turn brings in the other species so the fact that the tree ants have moved in to me, as an ecologist, I felt like I was skipping from the rooftops because it does mean that at least on the cavities that we're creating and some of the exposed wood that we've been creating using chainsaws, we are actually mimicking, at least to some extent, the ecological natural processes. So I have been on cloud nine over the last two months when I've been doing this field work because I climb up the tree with my endoscope and I'm just like, it's like Christmas. 
because I don't know what's going to happen, what I'm going to find. <laughs> it's like one of those lucky dip boxes you used to go to at Fates as a child, you know, what am I going to find in here? Tell us about the lifestyle of the tree ants. Well, I must admit, I'm not much of an expert on the tree ants specifically, but what I do understand is that they they use mycelium and they encourage the decay of already dysfunctional wood. And that in turn, there's several species that make use of the tree ant nest that they create, which is often in connection with some kind of damage or um, natural feature, whatever that might be, and that they then get other invertebrates coming in. In terms of the invertebrates that use old trees, there's just such a huge range. Um, we we had um, we did some put up some traps to find species a few years ago on these trees, and we found several of what we would call the heavyweights associated with decay in old trees. But we also found a whole host of flies that like newly decayed wood or newly dead wood. So again, all of that helps us understand that potentially these features we're creating manually will to some extent mimic what happens in nature and the ranges I mean everything from newly exposed fresh deadwood there are species that will use it and lay their eggs in it and the larvae eat or decompose the wood or they eat mycelium uh, then the larvae develop and come out and you see the exit holes you know the tiny wee holes that range from you know the size of a pinhead to something you could get your finger in um, that'll be all sorts of different species using it then you've got other ones like the um, parasitic wasps which are my kids always used to think oh they're disgusting because they you know they paralyze larvae and they put them into exit holes that have been created by beetles before them. And the larvae is paralyzed, but live. And it's like they put them in these holes, then they inject their own eggs into the live larvae. And then their eggs hatch and eat the larvae from the inside out, but it's fresh food. And I mean, all of that, all of these connections, Sharon, are fascinating. And disgusting but fascinating all the same and each stage in the process you know the tiny wee holes the exit holes lead to something else which leads to something else and it's what fascinates me about old trees and their ecology is that you kind of you draw a string in one place and a bell rings somewhere else and it's how all these different things are connected are just fascinating. How close are the trees in your studies to each other? So are they scattered randomly or do you always select trees which are, say, within 15 metres of each other? It's a good question and it varies. Um, each The sites are spread, at least in Sweden, there, there's about, I'd say, a thousand kilometres from north to south to east to west, distance-wise. Uh, there's two or three sites are what I would say isolated so where they're not directly connected to an existing old wood pasture site so the opportunity for dispersal is less and then we have other sites that are in the thick of peachy peachy sites you know like Ashford Common in, in uh, the south of England we've got trees that we veteranise there right next to 500 year old pollards um, in terms of distance between them, that also varies because it depends what resource is there, Sharon. So we had to go with nature in that respect because very often the trees are, I mean, oft, most of the sites, the trees are within an area, I guess, 500 metres by 500 metres on the whole. Um, so they're relatively close to one another. And there's 49 trees that we've selected on each site, of which 14 are control trees. So those we're doing nothing with and have done nothing with. And that is what gives us some strength, if you like, to our data, because we can see how much impact these different techniques have. And we can also see that the control trees have had things happen to them in, that, in those eight years. There was, there's a control tree that's dead, and I don't know why. There's another couple that we've seen that have kind of lost major limbs, been hit by lightning, that kind of thing. So that is also really interesting. 
because I'm not sure that we've got many studies where people have followed oak trees, you know, how long do they live? Uh, how many die in the different ages? Uh, so we've got a resource there as well to learn just about oak more generally without the veteranisation and the trees that we've treated. So it's, uh, you know, I, I'm very excited. You can hear that, can't you? I'm almost sitting there going, yeah, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> it's, it's so, so brilliant. And this study is a 10 year study in total. We were a, a bit cocky, actually, when we set it up, Sharon, because we've got no money. So the project's not financed apart from every now and again, we managed to squeeze out a bit of funds like we did this year to do the monitoring. But we said it was going to be 25 years. And uh, the reason that we said that was we just thought, well, you know, oh, everything happens so slowly. 25 years probably is optimistic to be able to see a lot of results so I'm very pleasantly surprised that we can see things happening already now after only eight years um, and I do hope that we can carry on 25 years and by that time I suspect that we'll really will see some interesting things happen but it depends on our funding really. Is there going to be an interim paper um, sort of coming out describing what's happened so far? There's one paper that's just about in the final stages of being published um it's just at the editing stage by the journal that's going in fungal ecology lynn body's journal and that was from some work we did in 2018 where we took sawdust samples from eight sites and looked at the fungal dna that was in the material and that's fascinating we can't actually say very much about veteranization from that work but what is fascinating was that they discovered there was in the region of 300 different species of fungi in both the control trees and the veteranized trees and that's led to another research project in Norway called the secret life of oak just about these fungal what we call endophytes so the latent species the species that are there in the tree about 60 percent of the species they couldn't put a name to because they weren't in the DNA database so that's really fascinating one of the most common species that we found in that work is a species that's only been described from Sweden to about four or five years ago. And it was the most common species that was already in the oak, just, you know, waiting for the right opportunity. So that paper will be published hopefully very soon, maybe before the end of the year. Um, and then the work that I've been doing this summer, I certainly plan to write something up. But like everything, Sharon, it's about time. And... The funding I have was for all the field work and to report all the results of the field work in an Excel sheet, but I'm not going to be able to resist doing stuff with it. So I'm hoping I'm going to start looking to see if there are any funds that you can apply for, for actually doing some, some papers, you know, actually writing some articles. Cause I think it, it needs a bit of time and you know what it's like when you've got your own business, there's not always time to, to do that kind of thing on top of doing normal work and, you know, everything else. The other thing that I've really been thinking about in all these long journeys, because I've been driving between lots of sites, what we've learned actually practically, the kind of tree physiology stuff, what techniques have given us the best results. A couple of the techniques we've done, we've done on branches. And I think that's pretty clear to me that that's not really worth doing because many of the control trees have already developed the dead branches that we've created eight years ago by themselves. So that's a really useful piece of information that I'd like to be sure we pass on to other people who are interested in doing veterinization is what techniques to concentrate on. And uh, we also, we've cut, we've also topped the trees that we've created these kind of nest boxes in. And as my husband said, they were very expensive bird boxes. Well, I think we've kind of come to the conclusion now that the birds are, are one part of the process, but we found bats in them and we found, wood mice in them and we found larvae we found these very odd looking leech like creatures inside them that appear to eat detritus and dead kind of snails and slugs and then other times you look in these holes Sharon and it feels like you know you see the pictures of the great migration in Tanzania on the Serengeti yeah. Well, I know this is going to sound a bit far-fetched, but you look... Not for me, it's an, I'm there. You look, in, you look inside one of these cavities and it's like that in miniature, but it's, it's wood lice. Wow. And it's 
mostly wood lice that you see in there, but you can see hundreds of them and they're moving around just like these pictures that you see of the of the wildebeest on the Serengeti, but in in miniature. It's so fascinating. What's going on there? Are they eating fungal mycelium? What else are they eating? And how, you know, they're all they've moved in and their role must be pretty crucial in cavity development. And it's made me think we actually we need masses more research on this, but it's pretty difficult, isn't it? People don't do a lot of research on cavities because they're often, you know, 12 metres up and a bit tricky to get to. So, I mean, there's all sorts of stuff that's going through my little head. Well, at the moment. I, I must say, I mean, that just brought such a vivid picture to my mind. Do you have any um, video footage of that? I did actually take a tiny bit of video. It's not brilliant quality because I've got an endoscope that I'm using to look inside the cavities. And I took a tiny bit of film footage. But one of my friends, stud, she does her research on wood lice and um, centipedes and millipedes. And I thought, I have to take this picture for, for, for Helen, but also for myself, because I just, it was exactly the image it conjured up in my mind was that this is a mini savanna in cavities but yeah i think I, I have got a film footage of it would you mind sending us a footage and i'll put it on our website on the tree lady talks podcast website so that people can click on that because if people use their imagination and and saw things like you see them it might really make a difference because with the micro scale what's happening on to the leaf litter and what's feeding on the dead wood and the mycelium is actually going to be the things that sort of save the planet, really. Check out the Tree Lady Talks podcast webpage. Have you had any disasters? Anything that you, you thought, oh, that really didn't work? We did five different treatments on the trees. One, we created a woodpecker hole, like, you know, a, a round cavity with an entrance. The other one, we did these kind of nest boxes, if you like, where we cut out a bit as big as a cheese bit of cheese and cut the back off so there was a hole in the back um and then the other one we did was what we call horse damage where we took the bark away from the base of the trunk those three have really i think are interesting we also ring barked some branches large branches so they were over 10 centimeters and we broke off some branches those two techniques i just feel like for two reasons the ring bark branches i think the trees do that naturally in the same time scale so i think that's a waste of money really to do that then the ripped branches they could potentially be interesting but it's really difficult to do any monitoring of them sharon to kind of what what do we look at because if they're up at eight meters do we collect fungal fruiting bodies that's difficult because you need to have a climber with you and given our limited funds that's not an option it's it's vicky and a harness up at four meters on a ladder that we've got a budget for um and some of the branches have ripped down the stem some of the branches haven't ripped at all we've basically just kind of got a bit of a bit of a rip on the actual outside of the branch collar so it's really that was a challenging technique to do and i feel like we're not there yet in terms of whether or not it's given us the benefits and being able to monitor and see what benefits it give us. So I guess in terms of, it's not a disaster, but it's a big lesson for me that actually the techniques whereby we do see the ring barking at the, or the, the partial ring barking at the base where we actually create holes in the trees are the ones that are worth us investing in now and working on in the future because those are the ones that appear to be giving us closer to what's happening in nature more quickly I suppose so no no disasters as such but lessons definitely to learn and when you created the nest boxes and the drill holes did you always have the same height on the tree and did you have the same orientation i.e were they all south-facing or were some south-facing and north-facing to see what's living in those different types of blocks of flats four meters was the height we set them at and we set them at four meters because the data we have, for example, for bats is that they, I mean, there's new data that's come to light since we did the work, but that we thought they were probably not much before three or four meters, but below three or four meters. But actually, they, they've been found in cavities at 50 centimeters above the ground. But that was one of the ways of thinking. Plus, birds tend to also be higher up to avoid some of the, the ground predators anyway. 
and four meters was a height that we could get up to with a ladder so that you know there was a practical thing there and then in terms of orientation we did at least on each site we've got seven trees with each treatment which means that at least one tree has each orientation and some have two so we did that that was the plan that we would have a mixture and we also did a stratification of the size of the trees so that we'd have a range of sizes because we took trees from about 25 centimeters to 60 centimeters in diameter too so that's one of the things we've measured this time round is the change in diameter since we did the original selection of the trees. So when you're uh, measuring the change in diameter of the trees did you notice a difference between the treated trees and the controlled trees in terms of how quickly they grew? I can't answer that question because we need to do proper statistical analysis on that Sharon actually okay um and then that was one of the things we want to do is actually see if there's a difference between the control trees and the treated trees and even between the different types of of treatments that we've done so i mean there will be inevitably a variation because you know how it is when you take a diameter of a tree if you and i do it it might be two centimeters up or down but i think still we've got enough trees because i mean there's 800 trees almost that i've measured now in in Sweden at least so we should be able I think to see if there is any difference so you have to watch the space for the answer to that question. This is such an important study how do you hope that it will influence people's policy and practice? My original thinking was that it would be a toolbox in nature conservation's toolbox that where we have generation gaps on these isolated sites it would give people a tool to be able to speed things up where we might otherwise lose species so by encouraging trees to develop cavities and hollows and decaying wood more quickly we might help save species and that's still what I really hope will be the case with the results of our veterinization work that you know we have sites maybe with you know 20 30 old trees left but we've got 500 oaks that are 30 centimeters in diameter perfect you know we've got plenty of trees there that can crack on and be 500 year old all in their own steam and we've probably still got 100 trees we could mess about with you know and try and create these sorts of habitats in so that's what i'm really hoping um, because i think we as nature conservationists need as many tools as we can get to help us manage and to help save species in the short and the long term Then the other side of the coin, which I guess maybe is something I'm less comfortable with, but is something that's real, is the idea of using this as a compensation tool. So in development and planning. And the thing is, is that we cannot ever replace a 400 year old oak tree. We cannot. It's just not possible. We can go to the moon, but we can't do that. So I would hate that veteranisation could be seen as a way for a developer to get rid of old oak trees. Oh, well, we can just veteranise a few trees and that'll be fine. So in that respect, I would be very sad if it was used in that way. But if we are to perhaps see it as an opportunity, then I think there is an opportunity. There's a project I've been involved with recently, which was a, a road development and The interesting story about this is that they set aside the land 40 years ago for this road development when it was a very young woodland. And because there's been various stops, finances and everything in the way, this 40 year woodland has started to be quite interesting. Uh, Lesser spotted woodpeckers moved in, for example, which is a protected species. So the, the road highway agency want to find new sites which are young woodland and see if we can do some work in those woodlands to make them suitable for lesser spotted woodpeckers so they can do their road development and there there's a potential opportunity for you, for us to use veteranization techniques where we might lose some habitat but the idea here is not to actually end up with less but to actually end up with more so that they are setting aside more land than would potentially be lost and we are trying some different techniques to see if we can speed up the quality of that habitat. Alternatively, they have to wait 20 years again for it to develop it naturally. I mean, it's the balance, isn't it, Sharon, between, 
you know, development which is going to happen anyway in many cases and the opportunity for us to improve perhaps associated land and to join up sites with existing values. Um, so, you know, I think that, as I said, I'd hate veteranisation to be seen as a kind of get out of jail free card for losing old trees. You know, we can't do that, but that it could be used as a technique to complement existing work and to improve the environment and help connectivity, then that would be great. Well, I think with the biodiversity net gain um, in the UK, which is going to become law at the moment, it's um, different local authorities have their own requirements for it. I should imagine that could be a tool as part of that. And I'm absolutely not talking about the removal of our older trees, but I'm talking about some other smaller trees maybe associated with that older tree that could be veteranised and well, you must be speaking to ecologists who work in the construction industry as part of your work. I guess yes and no. I mean, a couple of the projects I've been involved in, that's been the case where they've pulled me in to help to see if it's possible to do some of these techniques. But I guess I've been a bit cautious, Sharon, because we haven't actually had the results to show that it works either. So it's been a technique that we've been using primarily in nature reserves where we have this issue of generation gap on the basis that we haven't really got anything to lose on those sites and I guess also because we haven't had sound solid results because there hadn't been enough time really that's gone past I haven't really wanted to kind of push to push it plus also I guess I was nervous that it could be perceived and used for the wrong gains if you like which inevitably that happens in every walk of life so it's naive to think otherwise but it still it still felt like it was early days I suppose and now I mean literally just after the work we've been doing this summer I'm feeling a bit more confident I mean one example is just the bats you know that bats have always been notoriously difficult to find new replacement habitats for them and you know people have tried bat boxes with very limited success I think one of the papers I read from Germany they had I don't know it was a thousand boxes up and only less than five percent were used by bat a group of species that are declining and therefore if some of the work that we can do seems to be working for bats that feels like that's a real success and of course you're right to be cautious and gather the data scientifically and analyze it appropriately I'm just going off at a wild tangent think how can we get this good stuff out there and to see those mini savannas in urban areas just finally what is your dream scenario oh, my dream scenario would be to have a functioning savanna in northern Europe so it would be that we've got old trees we've got grazing animals and we've got sites that are interconnected in between them and we've got tree of all ages and sizes and species in between. The rewilding story that's going on across Europe is something that really is interesting to me and how we might work with that even in urban and peri-urban areas. Seeing everybody's got an old tree outside their house. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for your time, Vicky. It's been really great. Take care. Thank you, Sharon. That's very kind. Speaking to Sandra Johnson, otherwise known as Ant Boy, and seen on BBC Country File. Sandra, welcome. Thank you. It's, it's great to be here. It's great to be able to talk about this kind of stuff. It's so lovely to see somebody who's younger, just so passionate about the natural world. How did you first get involved with ants and, and insects? It was about six years ago when me and my family moved up from Edinburgh to Aviemore after I'd lived in Edinburgh the whole of my life. Um, my mum had signed myself and my dad up for a Cairn World's Nature Big Weekend event. So these events happen every, every year or so and they have a whole host of different things that they cover from land management, to farming, all the way down to insects. So the one that we were signed up for was learning how to identify different types of wood ants. Literally five minutes in, I got to admit I was totally hooked. I loved it. I wanted to learn more about these amazing insects that I called ants. So from that point on, 
me and my dad started to get into more nature surveying for people like Kermos National Park doing things like Nest Quest, uh, RSPB, and then our most recent one, which is the Rare Invertebrates in the Cairn Gorms Project, where we look out to protect and find six of the rarest invertebrates or insects in the Cairn Gorms. Wow, so what are those six rare invertebrates in the Cairn Gorms? Okay, so the, the six rare invertebrates, which are all currently insects, are you've got the Kentish Glory Moth, the Dark Bordered Beauty Moth, you have the Pine Hoverfly, the Small Scabious Mine Bee, the Northern Silver Stiletto Fly, and my favourite, the Shining Guest Ant. The Shining Guest Ant. Tell us about this ant. So the Shining Guest Ant pretty much does what it says in its name. So it's got a shiny coating around it, which has a dist is quite distasteful, which means that when a wood ant bites onto it, it leaves it alone. And it needs a shiny coat ant uh, because of the second part of its name, guest. This comes from the fact that it lives within wood ants' nests in small colonies of about 10 to 20 within a hollowed out piece of wood. They stay in this nest for the whole of their life, and even during the breeding season, they won't leave the nest, they'll stay in that area. However, they will move around whenever the main wood ants move around to a different nest, just so they're wherever the food is. So they're, they're just, um, are they really guests or are they unwelcome lodgers? Well, there's not a lot of data about this rare ant, so it isn't really confirmed. Some people say that they do actually help within the nest and they do different jobs. Other people say that they are pretty much pests. I like to hope for the first option, saying that there's a good reason that they're in there and they're actually being uh, welcome guests and they're being uh, good neighbours and, and all that. I think you're probably right, or evolution would have it a different way. So how fascinating. And tell us about the wood ant as well, because that's something you really have studied. What, what is their life cycle like and, and what do they look like? So the wood ant is one of the most common ants that you will get here up in the Scottish Highlands and most places in Scotland. So it's a mix between a brown and a black colour with um, a, a normal size that an ant would be. You get three different um, main types of wood ants in the Cairngorms. You get the Scottish wood ant, which is the bigger of the three of them and has bigger nests, which can be up to about two metres tall. So that's pretty much me in a bit so it's amazing how big they can actually get. You've then got the northern hairy wood ant which is distinguished by slightly smaller than the Scottish wood ant and also if you use a hand lens to look up close I like to say it's almost got a wee bit like eyebrows going along the side of its face hairs and it, hence the name it's a lot hairier than the Scottish wood ant. And the third one is a wee bit more rare and it's called the narrow-headed wood ant which is clearly distinguished because of the fact that it's got a wee dimple in, a, in its head, hence the name narrow-headed wood ant. So what are the ants' nests made of? So ants' nests can made, be made from a whole host of different things depending on the species. The majority of the times it's made out of twigs and soil. These twigs can be from Scots pine, birch, heather, depending on the species, but they all seem to be around the same kind of structure. As I was saying, the Scottish wood ants' nest can be up to about two metres tall. The rest are between two metres and quite small. The narrow-headed wood ants' nest is really small because there's not many of them in a colony, so it isn't able to sustain a big nest. What is their life cycle and what do they eat? So an ant's life cycle is quite similar to a bee or wasp as they are part of the same category in insects or invertebrates. So the queen of the nest lays all her eggs and she is the main starting point of this whole cycle. She lays the egg. The egg is then taken down to almost like an infirmary or nursery down deep inside the nest where the eggs then become larvae. These larvae then continue to grow and get fed and actually in the larvae stage, I find this quite funny, they're actually bigger than the adults, the adults wood ants. So they actually shrink in size as they get a bit older. Once they come out of the larvae form, then become the juvenile wood ants. So they're a wee bit smaller than the wood ants, but they still do the same amount of jobs. And then finally, they become the adult wood ants. Unfortunately, not all wood ants end up laying more eggs. It's only during special time during the breeding season when the males and future queens who have the ability to lay eggs 
come out with wings and fly around to mate to start this whole cycle over again. How amazing. And how long does that life cycle take? How long are they these big fat grubs are enormous and everybody working hard to keep them alive? Well, the wood ants are alive for about six weeks. Um, so it's between that, the majority of their life, I reckon, has probably got to be in the adult stage because that's the time where they're doing the most work. So I reckon, I'm not quite sure about this, but I reckon it's probably between maybe two weeks until they're full grown adults. Oh, quite fast, really. And what do they eat? So the wood ants can eat a whole loads of different things as they are omnivores. They can use the fungus, uh, they can eat fungus, they can use leaves, um, they can use grubs and stuff that they find on the forest floor. But there's one main thing that we love to talk about when the wood ants or what they eat. And it's these tiny little insects called aphids. So they don't actually eat the aphids themselves. They eat what the aphids secrete called honeydew. So this honeydew is a mix of the sap and sweetness from the trees, which the aphids live upon and eat from, combined with everything else that goes through the aphid. And this is like the heaven for these wood ants, which they feed to the larvae and they feed to themselves. They gather this honeydew by pretty much milking these aphids with their antenna. So we may be thinking we've been farming cows and sheep for as long as we can remember. But actually, ants have been doing it for much longer. And do the aphids get anything out of this or are they just happy to be milked? So the aphids, of course, get some repayment. And in this case, it's protection. Because of the aphids and because of their size and numbers, they have many predatory from spiders to other different species of wasps and much more which will try to eat them because of everything, including the honeydew. So the ants, because they're seen as the strong insects of the forest, they seem to protect the aphids in return for this honeydew. One thing that we also found out was that because these wood ants protect the aphids, it means the aphids can continue on potentially harming the tree. Although they don't kill it because the ants manage that, they will still continue to harm it. So some, some trees have created this special gland which pretty much produces their form of honeydew. So it's a type of nectar. This is secreted when the wood ants take all the aphids off from the tree. So this means the tree doesn't have any aphids on it and the wood ants still get the honeydew that they were wanting in the first place. So some trees have actually been really clever in creating this meaning that they can continue on thriving with the protection of the ants, knowing that they will do their job very well. I mean, ants sound like really good guys and they're very organised as well, aren't they? Tell us about some of the jobs that the individual ants do. So there's loads of different types of jobs that the, the ants will potentially do. Uh, up top, the highest rank you can get, there's also the queen who does all the egg laying and this is the main control centre for the whole nest. You've got the queen's maidens who look after the queen. You've got the soldiers who look after the nest. You've got the workers who do all the food finding and the building of the nest. You've also got the, the ones that look after the larvae, the ones who process the food and loads of other jobs that just haven't even been found yet. But it's such an amazing wee world that they've got going on and a wee system that they've got going on. We could definitely learn a lot from them. How do you study ants? Do you lie by the nest and watch them with a video camera or, or take notes? What do you do? Well, different species require different actions. For example, the shining guest ant, because there isn't many of it in a nest and they won't be out for that long on the top of the nest, we do have to stand watching it for about 15 to 20 minutes looking for this tiny ant, which can be quite difficult, but it's very rewarding when you find it. Looking for the other species of ants to identify them, as I was saying, we use hand lenses and these hand lenses give us a closer look up on allowing us to identify them a bit more. You can also look, study them different ways. Lots of people, lots of prop, uh, scientists have created fake areas where they can create the nests and they can study them from there. There's lots of things that people can actually do at home, like lots of different ants worlds, which are amazing to use. I've used them before and they're great fun to watch the ants do do what they do best 
in your own home, which means that you can study them and see how their whole lifestyle works. There's loads of different ways we study them so much that we, I can't even mention all of them. So can people see the busy lives of a wood ant online? Definitely, there's quite a few ways that you're able to see what happens with the ants, learn a lot about them. Two of which are woodants.org.uk. This is a really amazing website that tells you all about wood ants, which I've even contributed a wee bit towards, writing a few things for them. And the second way, which I definitely recommend, is my YouTube channel. So xanderjoe.co.uk will bring you right to it. And that's Xander with an X. On my YouTube channel, I've got loads of different videos about loads of different things, from the shining guest ant, to wood ants, to all the rare species I work with, plus lots more. Well, we're going to have a link to that on the podcast website. So um, that's sharonhosegoodassociates.co.uk. How fantastic. And before we move on to our next insect we're going to talk about, are the wood ants in decline or are the numbers relatively stable in the highlands in Cairngorms? Wood ants are actually classed as a red listed species and are near threatened. This is actually very surprising as there's loads of them if you went out for a normal walk in the forest up here in the highlands. But due to managed forestry and all these trees being cut down and the loss of habitat, it's really reducing the numbers of wood ants and wood ants nests. And the reduction of wood ants means reduction of shining guest ant, which is a very rare ant, which could become even more rare if this continues on going on. So that's why we really want to try and find a way to get the wood ants back to the stable population that they should be at, that we want them to be at. Finally, question on the wood ants, actually. How useful are they for us, the environment? What role do they play? Wood ants are so important to us and the lifestyle that we know. The wood ants clear up the fourth floor of dead insects, which then stops that from being all broken up. Wood ants are very important to life that we know it. They turn up the grubs, they eat all the dead insects on the floor, which creates 10 times more top layers of soil than earthworms actually create. So they're very important for that whole ecosystem. They manage the trees by the aphids and creating all that, which means that we've got all the trees that we need to give us oxygen without them being overpowered by aphids. They do so much that not many people recognize and that's one of my, me and my dad's main missions is to try and spread awareness of how important ants and insects in general actually are, just to show that we really do need them. So rather than planting lots of trees, let's try and save the insects and then they will in turn create more trees for us. Wow, oh, fascinating. It just goes to show again that everything is connected, absolutely everything. That's brilliant. And you're involved with another very rare species, the pine hoverfly. Tell us about um, what that creature looks like and its life cycle, please. So the pine hoverfly is another, alongside the shining guest ant, one of the rare invertebrates in the Cairngorms, the second of which I probably do the most work with. So the pine hoverfly is believed to be the rarest insect in the Cairngorms and it's very important that we keep its life cycle going. So the pine hoverfly looks like a lot of different hoverflies. It's got a honey coloured abdomen with the rest of its body being quite black. It's normally, the adults normally up in the treetops, so you're not as likely to see it up at that time during the breeding season, but we seem to find it when it's in its larvae stage. So the pine hoverfly goes from eggs to larvae to pupating to adults. And in its larvae stage, it's inside these things called rot holes. So this was typically um, hard rot fungus, a type of fungus that narrows out the inside of a Scots pine tree. This then, due to weather or wind or just old age, this tree will fall over, revealing a stump with a hole right down the middle. This stump is filled with wood chips and all the sugary goodness that used to be in this tree then filled up by rainwater, creating what we call organic soup. The bacteria then feed on the sugars, which the pine hover fly larvae feed on the bacteria. So it's a long story to get to the main importance of this larvae. Lots of other hoverflies feed on this 
organic soup, but it's a pine hoverfly that we specifically look out for. If this whole balance was corrupted, then that would be the loss of the pine hoverfly. So that's why we have come into place and started creating man-made stumps, because the hard rot fungus really isn't been doing its job and there's not enough of it left to create lots and lots of these stumps, which we need to, to reassure that the continuum of this species goes on. And it just goes to show these really niche habitats support such tiny, really important insects part of our ecosystem. I wonder if the decline of the fungus that is no longer doing its job might be something to do with climate change or maybe it's due to a, a different type of management, maybe over management of woodlands. Do you have any thoughts on that? The whole reason why their decline and the decline of this very special fungus has probably lead somewhere back to managed forestry and trees getting cut down for use and housing and human life. So without all this forestry, we could possibly have more of this fungus spreading around, spreading its spores around. We could have more rot holes, natural rot holes, which might have the missing secret that we don't have yet to making sure that the pine hoverfly larvae keeps on growing and grows in mass numbers. We might not have that secret yet, which the heart rot fungus did. So we really need that to continue on the species of the pine hoverfly and many other species of rare insects. Wow, so are there plenty of people like you and your dad going around surveying these insects in the Cairngorms or are more people needed? There's a good amount of volunteers that work for the project, the rare invertebrates in the Cairngorms. There's a few of us who look after each species and make sure that everyone has attended to needs. Unfortunately, I've got to admit, I don't think there's enough. There's a good amount of us that put in a lot of work, but we could be have a lot more people putting in a lot of work. And this is where the whole point comes in, getting more people, including my age, people who it's their future that's, that's being tested, involved in this kind of area. More people who actually have an interest in nature, activists who could actually come and have a look at what we do, see if that might change them to becoming a naturalist and then looking at how to solve the problem firsthand. That's what I think we really need to do. The information that you gather with the volunteers, what happens to that information? Does it go to a university to be studied or wildlife trust? The information that is gathered from the Rare Invertebrates Cairngorms project heads back to the RSPB. So the RSPB is the main creator of this project and they look after all the information, including lots of paid, paid workers who actually come along to do some of the surveying, they then look at the information and settle it out and put it out to wherever it needs to go to try and spread the word out and to let people know what's happening with these rare species. This is so fascinating. I wonder if people listening are really moved by this, can they get involved? Can they find other projects local to them? Definitely. There's loads of different ways that you can get involved with nature and insects. Simple things like if you live in a national park, that's a perfect place to start because it's a national park. There's loads of nature, loads of insects, definitely, and loads of projects that you can probably get involved in. Even if you don't, you can look for your local area, see if there's any volunteering going out, your local organisations, nature organisations, and try and get involved with that. But there's still another way to do it in your very own garden or windowsill or any place that you have. You can place bee hotels, butterfly houses, anything that will work just to make sure that you're encouraging nature into your very own home. Even if you have a bigger garden, you can add in things like insect hotels, rock and leaf piles, which are really simple to make. All you do is put a couple of rocks on together, some leaves in the corner of your garden, and it's a perfect place for insects and even leaf piles encourage things like hedgehogs. Like, there's loads of different ways that you can encourage things, and I've got a few more ideas like this on my YouTube channel. We're going to check that out. That's absolutely brilliant. And I think people just need to be a bit, a bit more untidy in their gardens, you know, and just leave things lying around. and rather than the big old autumn tidy up where we cut everything down, let's leave some things lying on the ground um, for the insects to live in. That's fantastic. I really recommend people see your YouTube channel. 
And finally, Sander, what would be your dream scenario? Well, for species like the wood ant, the shining guest ant, and the pine hover fly, to be honest, it's just for them to thrive again. The wood ant, there's still loads of them, but there could be more. Shining guest ant, to get more data about it and to understand more and see how we can help encourage it into a much more wood ant's nest, see if it is in much more wood ant's nest, to try and continue the population. Pine hover flies, try and get this fungus back. The fungus is what we need to make sure the pine hover fly continues on surviving and thriving because without it, we might not have the key to making sure that this species continues on. All these individual species have their own very needs, but a lot of it comes back to managed forestry. Managed forestry is a massive problem in, in our year and in this, this time period. And it's cutting down trees, cutting down habitats to make space for humans, for us. And if we had stopped doing a bit of that, then we could actually have more nature, more nature that could make more space for us and more nature that could help us continue on. Because without insects, nothing would survive, including us. Insects are the foundation of the whole ecosystem. Well, you've taken the words out of my mouth then. This is not a niche in interest about insects. This is not something that's just fascinating for our own sake. It's our very foundation block for life. Sandra, it's just been incredible to hear about the fascinating lives of these insects. I'm just going to carry on not gardening. And um, I think the message is we can all get involved, whether it be through volunteering directly or just looking at how we're living and how we're managing our own spaces. I can't thank you enough. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, do you know what? I never thought I'd ever hear any professional say that they'd gone at a tree with a sledgehammer. But to be fair, she has got a pretty good reason. I know it's really surprising. I mean, we only advocate the best possible tree care and using professionals, but that really showed me something. I mean, why didn't any of those trees die? They'd been hacked about a bit. And it's really surprising. I know that we're only in year eight of a 25-year study, but this is really showing that these habitats artificially created within the tree are a host to wildlife. Could this be a stepping stone from our ancient and veteran trees towards a wider countryside? It's great, it's exactly what Ant wants to hear as well. I call him Ant, I don't know why I should really call him Ant Boy. But actually it's exactly what he wanted to hear with his shining guest Ant and all of his fantastic species that he's, he's investigating and researching and doing so much work on and he's really working out what the insect world does in, in a way that will affect the things that are planned in the future, I'm sure. Everything is based on what's beneath our feet. The soil, insects, soil fauna, fungi, the role that insects play with decomposition. And, and what was really interesting speaking to Zander was how he said that everybody could have a part to play, whether it be through how they manage their garden or getting actively involved in community insect monitoring. Um, we, sh we all have a part to play. Don't forget, if you like this podcast, please subscribe to it, click the buttons, share it on your social media where you can. Um, and Sharon, what's coming up next? The next podcast features Tree Aid, an incredible charity changing the landscape and people's lives in the dry lands of Africa. They carry out numerous projects, have planted millions of trees, and their latest project includes a great green wall, which spreads across five countries. So far, 15% of the wall is complete. And they've got a target of 8,000 kilometres, so so much more is needed to achieve this ambitious and vital work. And people can get involved with it, they can't, can't they? They can, they can sponsor a tree. They can. They can sponsor a tree, they can support a community in new ventures, provide tools, provide training, 
It really is a multifaceted charity. And we'll have a lot of links on the site for, for that, how, you can, how you can get involved with that. Anything else coming up? Oh, yes. Well, the next one is going to be about trees and literature and art, where we're speaking to novelists and artists about how they see and describe the natural world. And then after that, we've got a Woodland Trust special, listening to policy makers, practitioners and the volunteers themselves. We're also going to have a forensically detailed tree investigation podcast, looking at the science and practice behind tree investigations. And we're going to have a couple of global ones. We're going to have tree officers from around the world and a global tree health issue. And I also think we should have a Christmas party. We'll have a Christmas party. Okay, well, you heard it first here. We may have a Christmas party. Now, there aren't going to be an awful lot of Christmas parties going on, I can tell you, you know, with the rule of six and all that. So we'll work it out. We'll try and find a way of doing it and we'll keep you in touch with that. And uh, in the meantime, well done to Xander and Vicky. Fantastic. And uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. On the Tree Lady Talks.